Welcome to Liberalism in Question. My name is Rob Forsyth, and in this series of podcasts on behalf of the Centre for Independent Studies, I examine issues concerning liberalism today, its strengths, its weaknesses, what its challenges it's facing, and how it's developing. My guest today is Dr. David Hart. David is a historian and libertarian with interests in the history of classical liberal tradition, especially the 19th century political economists and levellers. He's interested in walk and culture and film. David has a PhD from King's College, Cambridge, a master from Stanford, BA honours from Macquarie University here in Sydney. David has taught at in the Department of History at the University of South Ad, of University of Adelaide in South Australia for 15 years before he moved to the US, where he designed and built an award-winning website entitled The Online Liberty of Liberty for a non-profit foundation. He's now back in Australia, a keen independent scholar who writes in his bio an observer quote of a large recreational waterway in the Northern Beaches region of Sydney. David, welcome. Hello, nice to be here. What is liberalism? What's, what's your understanding of it? It's about freedom, about individual freedom and about trying to um, maximise uh, the opportunities that people have to develop as individuals, um, as families and communities, free of oppression or or coercion by other parties, particularly government, established churches and uh, ruthless predators who want to steal your stuff. Now, you tell us. It's a set of ideas and um, a set of institutions to try to prevent aggression against individuals and to create the ground rules, if you like, of uh, free and prosperous societies to operate efficiently. Before we came on air, you mentioned to me that this is the 50th anniversary of your discovery, Liberalism. Tell me about that. Uh, well, you're making me sound very old. Um, <laughs> it, it, was I was I. The... it was not I, David. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I know. Um, I, in 1973, I came across um, free market ideas and classical liberal ideas when I was a high school student here in Sydney, and that was uh, transformative uh, to me. I made myself a test at school by asking all sorts of questions. And uh, um, this coincided uh, with um, the coming to power in 1972 of the Labor Party with Gough Whitlam. And so it was a combination of seeing sort of uh, drastic political and economic change going on around me and seeing my liberal family in despair uh, at what Gough Whitlam was doing and then coming across all these ideas about limited government and free enterprise and so on that I was reading in these books and and the coming together of the theory and then the practicality of radical change in Australia was just an uh, an extraordinary experience and uh, I haven't been the same since. (laughs) I don't know how many young schoolboys read uh, Von Mieser and Hayek, but you were reading those great ones. Yes, I was. Uh, uh, Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard and Milton Friedman and... uh, Frederick Bastiat and a whole lot of other things. And I wanted to talk about it with my peers and teachers and so on, and they didn't want to know. It was something that <laughs> beyond their ken. Now, what what was it then that so attracted you and has given you a lifelong passion for it? Well, um, it was what a moral you- um, fervour in a way. I just came to realise that, the use of coercion against other people was immoral, um, that it violated their rights to life. You could kill, it was wrong to kill people. Uh, it violated their rights to property. You, d- you don't steal from people. You don't, uh, and person, you don't um, beat them up. You don't take their stuff. Um, and I always had that kind of um, Tolstoyan abhorrence of coercion. And I didn't know what to do about it. Economics, free market economics provided me with another framework to see how you could limit coercion by encouraging voluntary trade and transactions between people who thought they would be mutually better better off by engaging in trade. Um, So it was the combination of, of, of that sort of moral fervor opposing a coercion, but also seeing the logic and the beauty of how free markets operated. Um, And then the notion that without a space for people to be free, to be um, themselves, 
They were denied an opportunity of self-discovery and flourishing, which comes from experimenting and doing stuff and having a goal and seeking to achieve that goal and maybe even achieving that goal and, and personal satisfaction. So it was moral abhorrence of violence, understanding how free markets worked and how a political framework could enable people to flourish as individuals. As I understand it, you think of liberalism having a number of different facets, a number of different dimensions. Yes. Um, I think the, there are four dimensions that um, liberalism covers. Obviously, there's a political dimension, right? You want to have um, small government, um, responsible government that has low taxing. Um, uh, you need a legal system. So that's the second dimension, legal uh, freedoms. Uh, You need uh, protection of property rights. You need the protection of um, contract. Um, And, of course, there's the economic dimension, which most people think is what classical liberalism is, free markets. But I think it's only just one component. Right. Um, And the fourth one is um, what is loosely called social freedoms. That is, but I think of it more as individual or personal freedoms, that you should have the right to use your property as you see fit to engage in voluntary um, associations with other people um, that are mutually beneficial and not be interfered with by third parties. And this can be things like speaking, acting, or just living with someone, right? These personal freedoms is about choice of who you live with, who is part of your family or your household, um, what you can say to other people. Um, so there's the political, the legal, the economic, and the social. and uh, Unless you have all four together, I don't think you're a complete liberal. Really? Because I can see in those various people are different scales on different ones. Uh, yes, you, 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 you could be conservative on the social, but liberal on economic, for example. Yes, that's true. Which is, or, you know, you can, I keep thinking of um, the Hawke Keating years um, where yeah. um, they were Labour and so on the left, not liberal, but in many economic areas, they were pro-freedom and deregulation in, in favour of deregulation. So they were sort of more on the liberal side of, of that economic dimension. In fact, I need to clarify, we, we of course, in this series don't mean by liberal, the, the party that causes of liberal, of course. Yes. And yes. But and there's a sense in which you might say that in a general sense, I take your point about uh, different degrees of liberalism, both major political parties are working within a basic liberal democratic framework, despite their many flaws and failings. Yes. It's taken for granted. Um, now, you, your argument is, is that it's a moral case. Um, tell me, where did this all come from in, in human history? You're, you're an historian of liberalism. <laughs> Briefly, where did it come from and why? Well, it has roots um, going right back to the, the Roman period where there was um, many thinkers like Cicero and others who thought about uh, natural law and that individuals had uh, a nature um, that uh, involved um, – needing to have property to um, survive, to eat, to build a home, um, to to exchange things with others, to become prosperous. Um, And, of course, you have the Christian notion of uh, the individual soul, um, uh, which in order to flourish and develop had to be given certain freedoms, either to make good decisions or bad decisions. Um, Because they had their mixed with that was the notion of sin. um, but so I think within Western tradition, there is this long uh, history of two, two and a half mm. thousand years, perhaps, of thinking about individual rights and freedoms. This, and, and that this, this is where the moral dimension is quite strong. Of course, back in the Roman and early Christian period, they had no understanding of free markets or the theory of you know, price <laughs> no. and so on. Uh, uh, well, had, well, like, well, uh, when did liberalism become an ism then? Well, let me start off by saying that, first of all, it was an adjective, and then it became a, a noun. Um, right. in, the, in the 18th century, um, people like Adam Smith, for example, would talk about liberal sentiments, uh, that a person had a liberal disposition, that had a liberal character. Um, but liberalism as um, a noun, like referring to a person as a liberal or a, a, a political group as a liberal party, is not something that appeared until the early 19th century. And then, of course, it wasn't until, I think, 1859 that the Liberal Party was formed in England, um, which gave it a kind of um, 
authority then as a as a, a collective noun to describe a party. But until then, the, there were liberals and people who were radical Republicans. There were people who were radical individualists. There were people with liberal sentiments. Uh, so it's a real hodgepodge, uh, which makes fact, it difficult for the historian. Oh, no, no. It keeps you in business. What are you talking about? It keeps you in business, yes. <laughs> If it wasn't for that. <laughs> well, I'm retired now, so I have no business. <laughs> um, you mean by having an income? Um, what were they against? I mean, there, there does seem to be a movement in the 18th century, maybe earlier, the 17th century, 18th century, where, where, where these ideas suddenly get a prominence they did not have before. Can you explain that? To, tell, tell me about that, uh, David. Yeah, I think it goes back to um, the mid-17th century. I mean, you mentioned right. before that one of my interests is the, the levelers and, and those who were opposed to the absolute uh, monarchs. Um, and this is a political group during the, this is a group in England during the yes, Commonwealth period. Civil War and then the Revolution yes. of the Cromwellian period. Um, and liberalism is a funny thing because on the one hand it's conservative, but I'm putting air quotes around that. Um, and on the other hand, it's revolutionary, and, and there's always a tension. And what you have in, um, say, the 17th century with the English Revolution or the 18th century with the um, French Revolution is that monarchs overreach in their attempts to get more taxes, to pay for war, or to get greater power or whatever, and people react against that and say, well, I've always practiced my religion or taxes have always been at this low level. If you're imposing a new kind of religion on me or increasing taxes, I don't like that and I want you to stop. I want to conserve the freedoms and, and, and um, habits and customs that I have been, I and my family and community have been enjoying for a long time. Right? And that's what happens in the 17th and 18th century is this monarchical overreach. But on the other hand, as people began to think more clearly about what, societies are and how they can flourish and how people can get on with each other you have a theory of liberal behavior liberal ideas about property rights and individual liberty and limited governments and uh, legal institutions um, and so when people look around them and they say well i can see an injustice here now we should remove that injustice and so that's where um, liberalism has a sort of emancipatory or revolutionary dimension we can make things better. We can make free people freer by removing restraints that are imposed upon them. And the best example I can think of of that is the abolition of slavery. All right? Abolition of slavery had, or well, slavery had existed for thousands of years. What suddenly changed in the 17th and 18th century to make people think it, it was no longer legitimate? It was a whole set of ideas that uh, some from um, secular sources thinking about individual rights, natural law, some from religious uh, yes. sources with the Quakers and other um, sort of sects within the Christian uh, religion. Um, so liberalism has its conservative side and its radical side. In fact, I've got to ask about slavery because yeah. – um, we can see clearly a contradiction between the liberal statements of the American Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, and the actual on-the-ground existence of slavery and even the defence of slavery, which implies that liberalism can be sometimes be quite blind and yes, self-serving in some way. This is a very good point, and this is something that liberals have been struggling with ever since liberalism in the broadest possible sense, it started to emerge in the 17th century. People um, start to think um, if these ideas are reasonable and just, uh, let's apply them to as many areas of life as we can. And that's where they start to uncover injustices. For example, John Locke didn't think that rights applied to um, Jews and Muslims. Right? And it took uh, people taking some some of Locke's ideas about toleration and saying, well, hey, you're not being consistent enough. If you want to be truly consistent um, and uh, faithful to your ideals, we need to apply it to these other people that you have arbitrarily uh, excluded. And you could say the same thing for slaves. I mean, the, the argument was that slaves were property. They weren't people. Uh, therefore, it was perfectly legitimate to, to own slaves. And then people said, well, no, they 
certainly look and sound like people. They behave like people. <laughs> um, they work hard and, you know, love their families and children. So maybe they are people, but therefore they shouldn't be slaves. Um, and then again, the other contradictions gradually appear in the 19th century was, was things like with, with women's rights. Uh, uh, women um, were not allowed to vote. W- they weren't allowed to own property or run a business. So, and people said, well, if these liberal ideas about ownership and freedom and running a business and so on are true and useful to us, why doesn't it apply to women? And then, of course, you have gays and so on. So th- there's this gradual expansion, I think, as liberalism has developed over the centuries, where there was a core group of people who had rights and privileges and freedoms. And over time, pe- um, people have said, well, maybe it applies to women or maybe it applies to slaves. Or maybe it applies to um, to gay people. So what you have is an expanding set of concentric circles as uh, freedom is understood to apply to everybody not just an elite group of white males. You're giving us here a potted wig view of history. Well, I think there are setbacks. <laughs> so it's not a, a thought that there was a, a constant uh, movement towards progress yes, and yes. I- improvement, uh, but I don't think it, there is. I think we've, in the last uh, couple of decades, we've seen a, a definite retreat um, in well, the scope that liberty has. Um, well, so let, let, not let, let, interpretation. Let, let me come to some of those issues. Um, yeah. it, it, it does seem to me there was a highlight in the 80s and 90s when, certainly in economics, liberalism seemed to be very strong, uh, often called neoliberalism, whether, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. But it, it, does, it does seem to be in the last 20, last 10 years, maybe even younger, there has been, liberalism has come under a severe criticism, a lot of criticism. And from all over the, and, uh, and, uh, so my question to you, uh, David Hart, is why? why you want me to answer this so, in five minutes? <laughs> well, well if, if you wouldn't mind. Uh. <laughs> no, right, uh, let, me give a shot. let me go back to um, <clears throat> my history. Uh, my, back in 1973 when I was discovering some of these ideas for the first time, Hayek wins the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1974. Yep. I thought, wow, we're on a wave here, you know. If, these ideas, uh, which have been ignored for 30 or 40 years, um, the leading advocate can get the Nobel Prize for economics. This is really, really good. And then, of course, you have Thatcher and Ronald Reagan um, being uh, influenced by free market ideas and some ideas about limited government and them getting into power. And you think, wow, this is really, <laughs> we're really on a roll. You know? yes. So where's it going to end? Um, And then, of course, uh, reality sets in and there is a reaction and a a pushback. And uh, the Reagan and and, uh, Thatcher revolutions uh, sputter out and um, we get sort of middle of the road social democratic governments um, going back to the to the old game of, you know, um, pandering to the electorate and um, giving handouts at election time and people demanding more and more of the government and so on. Um, and and for, for the last two decades, I think, uh, liberalism has been um, largely eclipsed. Um, and it's often in the, in the wake of so-called crises. Um, Robert Higgs, the American economic historian, has this very interesting theory about what he, that he calls the ratchet effect. Every time there's a crisis, people say, oh, my goodness, the government has to do something. The government reacts to um, the demand of the electorate and and the intelligentsia and introduces all sorts of uh, legislation and controls and so on uh, to, quote, unquote, solve the problem. Uh, But when the crisis is over, there is some relaxation of these new controls and new taxes and regulations, but it never goes back to what it was before. So uh, if you have a wave of crisis after crisis after crisis the ratchet effect is that it goes up doesn't come back down to where it was before then goes up again and ratchets up and we've been seeing a classic example of that since the 9-11 attacks um, in the u.s um, the global financial crisis of 2009 um, and now of course with the covid uh, lockdowns and um, liberalism i think is very much on the back foot uh, now, some some people, um, some people wisely and some people unwisely, 
blame inherent weaknesses in liberalism itself for this problem. I'll, I'll, I'll get, here in Sydney, there's a commentator uh, who um, defined neoliberalism as what's good for business is good for the country, um, and then complained about crony capitalism being a result of yes. liberalism. Yes. Now, but could could, yeah, could yeah. you could you this man is a learned economist? Could you correct him? My view is that's not that's not neoliberalism. That's something else. Def- sneaking in as liberalism, isn't it? Well, as I said at the beginning, I mean the, the four dimensions of of freedom applies to everybody, not just business people. That it applies to every single person who is a consumer or a producer or a worker. Um, that they have certain rights and freedoms and property rights and so on. Um, you can't give favour to any one particular group over another. And what governments do constantly is they represent certain coalitions of vested interests. Um, typically, the Conservative parties um, favour business organisations, larger banks and, and uh, investment firms, uh, large manufacturers and so on. Uh, but that's not liberalism. That's just you said crony capitalism. It's, it's yeah. but this is just vested interest politics. And on the leftish side, um, they have a different constituency or alliance of vested interest that they um, pander to. Um, so neither left nor right in the modern parlance um, treats pe- everybody as equals. Some are favoured over others. Um, but I would say a, a consistent and true liberal is not con- is interested in each and in every individual's rights to life, liberty, and property. No favoritism, no partisanship, no special deals, level playing field, equal rules for everyone, and you succeed or fail according to your own merits. I think on this podcast, one of my other guests made the point that uh, liberalism is in favour not of business but of but of competition and markets. Well, that's only one side. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah um, I understand. But, but in other yeah, words, that, rather than being pro-business, it means no, let business fly, thrive, but let them compete, let them let them fight out it out fairly. Well, they're not really fighting. What they're doing is it's rivalrous. So I prefer the term rivalry to okay. competition. Right. Um, the what the only way to make money in a truly free market is to satisfy the consumers, give them what they want, or even more than they want, at a price they can afford. And uh, you keep your costs down and you can make a profit. And what they do, what business people do is they are rivalrous. They jostle for attention. They want your your money, but they can't force you to give them uh, your money. You have to hand that over voluntarily. I don't see that as competition. That's just like they're making offers and counter offers. And if you're a free person in a society where property rights are respected, you can say no. I don't want to buy your product. I want to buy someone else's product or not buy a product at all. But when there's greater freedom, of, just take with economic for a moment, David, um, you're going to find some businesses succeed and some will fail. In fact, yes. one of the great engines of progress has been what uh, is described as creative destruction. It's it's the old failing, those that don't meet their customers' needs eventually go out of business and, and you improve come in. Now, that's fine, but when that happens, people get hurt. And there's one of the one of the complaints about this liberal period we're talking about is it's led to increased inequality. Uh, it's led to people having jobs outsourced to other countries and so forth. And this is one reason that's often said why liberalism is no longer in favour. Yes, you hear that argument. Um, a common one that's um, you hear more often now in America is this, especially from the national conservatives, right? That they're America doesn't produce stuff anymore, that it's all been outsourced to China and the American working class is shrinking and this is an appalling situation. So we need to have the government step in and with an industrial policy to revitalise industry. But economists, um, free market economists have said um, this is only a very partial picture right? because when you look at American industrial activity until the COVID uh, recession occurred, um, American production or profits or the value of um, goods that were being produced was ne- has never been higher. Right? The, the, it's not that Americans aren't producing anything anymore. 
what they're doing is that they're producing it so efficiently that they let, need less people to do it. And the comparison is with agriculture. Back in the late 19th, uh, early 20th century, 40% of the American population uh, were on farms. Um, today, the output of agricultural products is so, so much more than it was in 1900. But it requires I don't know, one twentieth or one fortieth of the personnel. Uh, so what's happened is that there has been um, the shift from agricultural employment to other employment. And in the case of America, it was through industrial uh, employment, first of all. Now it's through services. And we, but we don't know where the next uh, area of expansion will be. But we know from the past that every time um, productivity increases, um, innovation occurs, uh, scientific and technological development, some people are made worse off, but the vast bulk of the people are made better off. We can't predict that. Um, it's just a fact of life. We can, we can, yeah. we, we can merely keep going. Sorry, David. Um, the other thing is that if another sort of set of arguments would be that why is it um, that people stop buying products that are made by, say, national manufacturers? Right? Say there's a car industry in Australia that produces an Australian-made car um, and uh, people don't want to buy that car anymore. They use their consumer choice to say, well, no, I, that no longer suits my needs at, at that price. I want to buy some other car or not buy a car at all. Uh, but what the government in, with, in its national industry policies will say, well, we need to keep uh, manufacturers of Australian cars in business. We need Australian workers who work in Australian manufacturing plants to stay in business. So we're going to force the consumer to buy Australian car made cars, whether they like it or not. So we're going to coerce them. Now, that's terrific for the Austra owners of the Australian car manufacturing industry. It's terrific for the workers who work in those factories, but it's a bum deal for the consumers. So the question is, all change hurts someone and benefits another person. Sometimes those choices are voluntary. People say, well, I don't want to buy from your shop anymore. I'm going to go to the shop down the street. Should the government then force you to buy your groceries from the place you used to buy them? so that person can stay in business? Or do I have the freedom to go down the road and buy it from some new competitor? David, would you agree there is there is always a place for some coercion in society? That is, there's a rule of law yes. and uh, um, there's taxation in order to run things. So you're not you're not giving me a completely anarchistic view of society, are you? Uh, yes and no, I am. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, the question about coercion is uh, you want to try to keep it to a minimum, right? There's always coercion taking place. Sometimes it's done privately by robbers and thieves um, and muggers. Sometimes it's done by institutions and organisations. Um, the question is, if you want to be consistent in your uh, desire to see coercion reduced, you need to look at where the major sources of coercive activity and as you identified the government is a major institution which uses coercion the classical liberals would say well let's minimize it let's keep it to the absolute minimum of just protecting uh property um free movement and freedom of speech and so on and we have courts and we have police who can do this um but we don't want the government to overreach and do too much uh, exercise too much coercion um, now, there's another group of within the, the liberal tradition, which is more radical than that, who say that uh, the trouble with that is that it's rather naive and utopian, because even if you do have a constitution which strictly limits the power of the government, the government will constantly get around those restrictions and increase its power and its coercion against, against other people. Um, and even the greatest experiment in limited government which was the American Constitution and the American Republic, has failed to keep its government limited. Right. So that's the big question is, if you believe in limiting government, how do, how do you um, do it in the first place and how do you keep it limited? I guess one of the reasons why liberalism is, is not as popular today because people believe in other goods than just liberty. They, they oh, yes. believe, believe in equality. They believe in, in looking after... People that Diversity, are falling out of the system. Um, yeah. No, no carbon. What? All sorts of things. 
how do you how do you make your liberalism out trump forgive the phrase all the all their other concerns that is i'm challenging your your mono your mono focus your single focus that's 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 something that i um grapple with almost on a daily basis is people seem to have lost the will to be free there's they no, no longer hold it as a high value that used not to be the case and the question is why have people shifted their value preferences to something else um, and people like me who, who who want liberalism to become a thriving um set of beliefs and uh, that people um adopt and want to act upon we have to um, persuade them that liberty is the way in which they can fulfill their dreams and aspirations and lives and the same for their children and their families and i don't know how to do that i think in the past people have turned to, back to liberty because of oppression when people come down the street and start beating you up and taking your stuff and c- dragging your children away to be conscripted and fight in the army uh when troops go through your farms and burn your crops that makes people angry and they say well i want to be free i want to be free of this oppression but in a way our lives are too comfortable that even though we're being repressed we're still prosperous <laughs> so why should we be free oh, my argument will, will be will you be even more prosperous you'd be you'd be able to flourish even more if you were free um but people don't see it that way let me change the topic just very slightly one of the great um reasons for liberalism in the west was in order to deal with the problem of pluralism of religious and philosophical pluralism and that's why it does seem to come after the terrible wars that 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 wrecked the the raid through europe uh, after the challenges of the reformation and so forth and that means that liberalism at least in some views of it does not have a big picture view it deliberately avoids the big answering the big questions of life it leaves that up to others into institutions and individuals do you see liberalism as that kind of constrained or do you see it as a vision of life Uh, are you big L liberalism or sport L liberalism? Well, actually, the the discussion that um, is that takes place in libertarian circles in the US is between thick liberal libertarianism and thin. Thin. Libertarianism. No, that's the word. Okay. Yes, that's thick the word. and thin. You know, um, I know it's going to be very hard to persuade a lot of people to adopt my views about um, experimentation toleration of diverse views um an openness to hearing criticism and so on that that's a very enlightened um 18th century enlightened view but i think we can um talk to people who radically differ from us and saying well if we want to live together peacefully and not get in each other's way here are some basic rules about respecting each other's property and about respecting each other's lives so even if you disagree with everything i think about uh, concerning religion, we can still, you know, go about our business without getting in, e- in each other's ways. Now, that's sort of like thin liberalism. Um, it's just a basic framework, a set of yes, rules yes. to minimise uh, coercive conflict and 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 uh, friction, if you like, between groups. But I think personally that there is a thicker form of liberalism, which which is that um, being a thoughtful and criti- critical person about um, how we should live our lives means that we should try to abstain from coercion. We should respect other people's uh, right to do similar things with their lives, um, that we should not just leave them alone but also have some kind of common feeling for them, right, that these are our fellow human beings who have feelings like us um who have aspirations like us uh we share certain things about wanting to be prosperous to see our families flourish um to, we, we want to have friends and neighbors that we get on with uh not constantly fighting and shouting at each other um so i think those ideals um of how a lot li- a good life can be lived a good free life can be lived um, is something that I would like to try to persuade people to adopt as for their um, own um, life philosophy. But it's not necessary for us all to believe that, for us to have a minimal liberal society where people don't kill yeah. each other, steal from each other. But you I'd start- like to live in a community that had shared values. Um, 
we can joke about the same thing, for example. We don't so have there to is support the same football team, but we can all joke about. Um, this is a bit a bit where you common. started, but a bit where you started, David Hart, when you said that for you it was a moral case for liberalism. You, as, as it was not just practice; it was a moral case that first moved you to see the value of of liberalism. Our yes. time's drawing to an end. Um, yes. You've been rather pessimistic about how the world's gone on liberalism. <laughs> uh, do do you remain pessimistic? Um, in the short term, yes. I think uh, we're facing a whole series of really severe crises uh, where I, no one is talking about liberal solutions to these crises. And as I said before, people don't even value liberty as highly as they once did. So I don't see much hope um, in the near term. However, I'm a Hayekian, I think, at heart, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, um, that I believe that uh, policies um, are the result of what people think. So the first pl thing to do is to change the way people think, and then hopefully they will realize, will act on those ideas and change the way they behave, change the institutions that they live in, change the way they interact with other people. Um, at the moment, I think the spread of classical liberal ideas is at a very low level, a kind of stasis, where we're not making much progress. In fact, the opposite is happening. Um, but I'm also fairly hard-headed, I think, in that bad ideas produce very bad results, and people eventually hit a wall of reality. They don't like high taxes. They don't like the collapse of the um, electricity grid. They don't like, um, you know, having to um, do obey every single command and, and order from some bureaucrat in Canberra. Um, and I think they will eventually be forced to rethink some of their ideas. But so that's back. a generational thing. So you, things have to get bad for people to re rediscover the value of liberty. That's been the historical practice yeah. in the past. So I, I mean, don't think why, how, how we're exempt from that. No, no, it's happened a little bit. In, in Europe, um, with the inv Russian invasion, suddenly people are interested in values that it seemed to me they either took for granted or regarded as old-fashioned. Yes, but it, it's just a pity that crises like that have to occur um, for people to of course, start of course. to wonder. But you see, the way in which the intellectual climate is right now, uh, people are, not, are more likely to say, well, the government should step in and do something for us rather than, oh, maybe we need to think about what we think government should do. Yes. David Hart, thank you. Thank you so much. You've, you've been so stimulating and helpful. I'm sorry I've had, to, I've had to put your many years of thought into just this half-hour podcast, but thank you very much indeed. Much appreciated. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me on. This has been another podcast in the Liberalism in Question series here at the Centre for Independent Studies. I've been speaking to Dr David Hart, retired historian and very active fighter still for liberty. Thanks for watching.